thank you for your attention thus far. Uh, you folks are really lucky, as am I, because now we get to hear from Professor Mark Henderson. And Mark teaches at Mills College and has for quite some, quite some uh, years. And in fact, I have read uh, the two articles that I think you've been asked uh, to consume as well, because I'm on the board for education about Asia. Uh, so the article they wrote in 2004 talked about experiential learning and field trips, taking students uh, to China and that sort of thing. And then this more recent article looks at being able to do that using web resources and others. And so we are extremely fortunate to have uh, Mark Henderson, who's a professor of public policy. And it's important to keep in mind the many ways in which we interact with China. And we talk about economics and we talk about presidential summits and things like that, but we interact on many other levels. City planning, all environmental degradation, trying to mitigate uh, that and to do other kinds of things, uh, such as involves healthcare. You're gonna be hearing uh, more about that later today but a wide variety of subjects. So prior to his service in academia, uh, Mark helped to improve the United States by being a staffer at the Environmental Protection Agency, um, an endangered species these days, okay? So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Mark Henderson. Uh, thanks for the warm welcome, and uh, what's another lovely presentation this morning? You could have listened all day and uh, still had more to learn. So thank you, Clay, for the, this morning and for that welcome. Um, again, my name is Mark Henderson. I teach at Mills College across the bay uh, in Oakland, California, which many of you may know as a historically women's college. Uh, I want to put a little asterisk on that to say that we were the first women's college to open a transgender-friendly admissions uh, policy a few years back, and that our graduate programs, including my own master of public policy program, has been co-ed from the beginning. So if you've got uh, promising young students who uh, would like a small liberal arts college in the Bay Area, that sort of experience for their undergraduate or graduate years, I hope you'll consider sending them my way. Um, I'm here to talk uh, under this, this umbrella of China, globalization, and the environment. And we got uh, started talking about the topic of globalization uh, in Clay's uh, talk this morning. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious that you can't talk or you can't understand China today without wrestling with this concept of or phenomenon of globalization. And you certainly can't understand globalization today without uh, putting China in the center of that conversation. Uh, my own area of research is environmental policy, um, land use, and climate change, both in the US and China. And so um, I'm going to bring that angle into the discussion uh, as, a, as a focus. And what I'm hoping is that uh, a few, minute, few more minutes into my talk, after some uh, introductions and uh, explanations, uh, as many of you who can, will open up uh, a Google Chrome browser or the Google Earth app on your laptop or on your phone, uh, downloadable uh, uh, app, and we'll explore some of the places in China and elsewhere in the world that are connected in this web of, of a global supply chain. And we'll think as we go through those processes by looking down from, from the sky uh, what the environmental impacts might be on the, the environmental resources, on the people who live there. Um, and this is an exercise I pioneered with uh, my class at Mills uh, on, on China globalization and the environment a few years back and then wrote about it in this uh, Education About Asia article uh, a few years ago. And of course things have changed, the software has all changed and uh, since then, so we'll, we'll do it live. And I'm hoping that uh, for some of you this is uh, an accessible sort of uh, experience you could uh, share with your students, uh, either as a one-off class exploration or um, as I do in my class, uh, group projects where I have students uh, spend a week tallying the things that they use and where they're from, and then do some research, uh, pick, pick one, work in a group, and, and trace back where did it come from, where did it pass through, how did all the components get put together and into your hands, and even more so, uh, or in addition, where does it go when you're done with it. All right, so this is a little bit embarrassing, but I was, uh, as I was preparing for this, I actually had got a box of old photos from my sister, and that's me in the 70s sometime on a very hot summer day in Sacramento where I grew up uh, in a pink plastic swimming pool trying to get cool and uh, with some of the neighbors from uh, across the street. And this was a, uh, 
the point where I was learning to read and at the point where I was just fascinated with words, as kids get to be when they start to recognize words. And somewhere on this pink plastic swimming pool, as I was sitting there in the heat, it said, made in Taiwan ROC. And I spelled that out. And I was like, what's that? And uh, the nice suburban dad from across the street, Mr. Fong, said, oh, that's Taiwan, Republic of China. And I said, oh, OK, so the swimming pool came from China. That's kind of neat. He said, no, 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 it's, it's not really China. It's Taiwan. There's this other China. And you don't get things from there. <laughs> OK. And there, you know, over the years, I got a little bit more of the history of it. Mr. Fong and his family had come over in the 1940s. Uh, they still had relatives back in mainland China that they had gone a long time without being able to communicate with at all. And it was only with President Nixon's opening that they started to, to reconnect. Uh, but it was a rare thing to go to China, to connect with China, to get a product from China in the 70s. But not, not that rare at that point to get some things from Taiwan. Um, and so as, you know, as a little kid looking for patterns, you start seeing these everywhere, made in Taiwan, ROC, made in Taiwan, made in Taiwan, on a lot of different kinds of products. And then if you keep looking, um, this is again the 70s, even more things made in Japan. OK, so I'm getting just this vague awareness of there, there are other places, and some things come from those places to Sacramento, California. Um, Japan, of course, was um, it pioneered that economic strategy of uh, export orientation. So it said, uh, rather than uh, doing as, say, the US had done in its early years, trying to block imports and substitute uh, products made domestically, it said, yeah, we'll go ahead and import complicated things and expensive things and highly uh, uh, high skilled, high quality things, and we'll export uh, the cheaper things. And we'll engage in trade that way, and we'll build up our economy and our skill, and then later we'll move into things. So by the 70s, um, the plastic swimming pools were being made in in uh, Taiwan, but things like cameras and then some smaller cars and things like that were coming into the American market from Japan. Um, so just in the very vague sense of you know a student growing up noticing that things come from different places and that there are patterns with that. Um, as imports from different Asian countries um, surged through the 70s uh, and into the 80s, we got a little bit more attention to things that were actually made here. There was a lot of Buy American sentiment. Um, so you might start noticing those. And of course, the, the, uh, to make that work, to send more things overseas as well. And imports uh, and exports both arise in this era. Um, we've always imported and exported. Some of our major trading partners are in Europe, uh, Canada, Mexico. Um, speaking of uh, political statements, the, do they think that we won't notice that the French, uh, where it says made in China, and, uh, made in Canada in English, it says made in Quebec in French? Um, that's kind of funny. Um, but of course, then we start to get uh, the, the rise of imports from mainland China, the place we didn't get stuff before in the 70s. And it seems everybody, even people you might not expect, are sending their um, products to be made in China. Um, why does this happen? Why does it happen when it happens? Well, let's look at the numbers a little bit first. And then we're going to talk about trade in a way that you might uh, bring up in an economics class or social sciences, cl social studies class. Um, so China's the fattest green line here, and you go back to uh, 1985, which I think is the um, earliest data I could get from the U.S. Census Bureau here, and it's down at the bottom. It's close to zero imports from mainland China, um, but we're getting a lot of things from uh, Japan. Uh, we're getting more things actually at that point from Canada. Uh, we start tracking Europe as an entity in the mid-90s and uh, putting all of those countries together. They're our major trading partner. But China climbs consistently, even in the dip in imports uh, in the Great Recession. Uh, China doesn't dip as much as everybody else. And it's soon it's past Mexico, it's past Canada. And it's, uh, we're pretty much importing in dollars um, about as much as from all of the countries of Europe combined. And in terms of stuff, uh, I love that clip from The Office because if you look at the number of pieces of things, small items that you find, I uh, want to take a bet on this uh, clicker here. I don't see a sticker, but um, if your students are going to track where things they touch on a daily basis come from, they're going to see China probably more than, than anything else. Um, 
So this doesn't come as a surprise to any of you. It may come as a surprise actually that those, the dollars from Japan leveled off to the extent that they did. Um, a lot of stories behind that. Some of it is uh, Japanese country, companies deciding to build their products in the US just as uh, foreshadowing the, uh, the US investment in, uh, or sorry, the uh, Chinese investment in South Carolina uh, car manufacturing. Let's go on to this. This is the Port of Oakland between uh, down, down the hill from Mills College and across the bay from here. Um, something you might want to cover in your classes is this whole discussion of why we trade at all. This is sort of basic economics 101. Um, and then from that, how is this current era of globalization different from the sort of trade that's happened uh, as long as there have been people in different places who could move goods from one place to another? Uh, so why do we trade? Uh, and the phrase comparative advantage came up this morning. Uh, it's the economic jargon for it, but basically somewhere can produce something better, cheaper, or faster than you, and you've got something that you can produce better, cheaper, or faster than them, and it's your mutual benefit to meet somewhere in the middle and hand them off, and everybody's better off rather than, uh, say, us trying to produce something that they produce really well in Spain or uh, in Denmark or wherever it is. So we do that. Uh, why can places produce things better, cheaper, and faster than other places? Well, they might have natural resource endowments. Uh, they've got minerals in the ground. They've got crop growing conditions that uh, make it advantageous to produce that product there. They might have labor advantages. They might have cheaper labor. They might have labor of a certain, uh, with certain skills. They might have traditions or uh, a culture of innovation that's made them um, more productive in, in developing certain um, industries. And all of those things together go into the um, uh, advantage that a country or a region or a company uh, has in, in trading. Um, so since I teach public policy, I also say, well, there's a policy environment to this too. Uh, different places set up different uh, regimes or sets of rules uh, around trade. They set up tariffs. They charge people money to bring things into their country, taxes. Uh, they set up labor regulations and environmental regulations that govern uh, how much you can uh, ask of people or what you can do to the natural environment to produce things in your own country. Um, and other regula regulations like that uh, that change the uh, incentive structure beyond just uh, the natural resources and the labor pool. Um, so when we think about trade in, here in California, I like to say that uh, we've been part of a global trade network going back uh, longer than California has been a state. So um, the, uh, anyone know some of the first uh, Europeans that came not from the south but from the north down the California coast were the Russians, right? Came down out of Alaska. Uh, you can go visit Fort Ross up on the north uh, coast and they were here to uh, hunt seals. And it's like, okay, they were here to hunt seals and bring them back. Where did they bring them to? Well, some of them probably went to Russia, but a lot of them went to China. Uh, and in fact, in the Qing dynasty, a certain level of Qing official wore a robe that was lined in California seal skin or seal fur. Um, and they were getting that from the Russians who were getting that from California. So we were part of a trans-Pacific uh, trading network back into the, the 1700s. Uh, on the other side of the continent, uh, you remember the story of the Boston Tea Party, a uh, key event spark sparking the American Revolution. Where do you think the tea came from, all right? Who was growing tea in that time? So the British were shipping it from China, uh, putting a stamp on it or demanding that Americans pay a tax on it. There's a policy issue there. Uh, Americans took objection to this, dumped it into Boston Harbor. Um, the next step in that story after the revolution is that the first American flagged trading ship uh, was named the Empress of China, and it was going back the other way to get China, uh, get tea and other things from uh, from China to bring back without going through those pesky British. Uh, anyone know what the, we were trading to China at that point? Silver. Silver, probably it was the currency of the time, but a natural uh, grown product in North America that we were trading to China was uh, close ginseng. Anybody get that? Okay. And that's still a, something we, we have in the forests of North America uh, or we cultivate and we send back to China. It's still, uh, still part of our trade balance. Um, all right, so this goes back a long way. And I've even seen an anecdote that um, in an Inuit uh, archeological site far in Northern Canada, um, finding beads that were produced in the Tang Dynasty. 
And we're still not quite sure which way around the pole that those beads would have been traded from one to another. Uh, but somehow they got there, and presumably some other uh, goods traveled in the opposite direction to make that happen, maybe not the whole way around. Um, so trade's been, been around a long time. But we have a sense that, that the global trade, the globalization that we're in now, is a, is a different thing than a seal skin or a cask of tea uh, traveling around the world. Um, all right. So why does this happen now? Well, the, the picture we're looking at here with all of those containers, thousands of standard size steel containers uh, is a big part of it. Uh, from the 50s and especially uh, during the Vietnam War era, the shipping industry uh, settled on this standard unit for um, putting things in and getting them to places intermodally, putting them on ships, loading them onto trucks, loading them onto trains, whatever you need. Um, and that's greatly increased the efficiency by which we can move bulk goods across uh, around the globe. Uh, it also helps that these um, were, we've been in an area, era of cheap energy. So you can put them all on a ship and you can power that ship across fast distances at a really low cost per unit um, once they're, they're standardized like that. So we've got some technological innovation. We just have a green on standards and what size uh, a container is going to go and how you, how you stack them up and transfer them from one place to another. Uh, and then another innovation that's, that's sort of behind the scenes, but um, electronic customs records actually matter. That we agree that rather than having an inspector open up each cask and look at each thing, uh, that most of that uh, inspection of things coming and going from countries is going to be on electronic manifests that can be transmitted at uh, more or less the speed of light and checked off and the tax paid. Uh, that speeds things up tremendously um, so that we can, we can have this um, uh, constant flow of goods for, um, across countries. Then we get uh, credit uh, to some of the Japanese companies for popularizing this, the just-in-time manufacturing uh, rule, that each plant is set up to receive inputs that will come in just so they need them, and they do what they do them, and they pass them on to the next stage in the process. Um, and so that's a, a process innovation uh, that spreads. And then it stops, stops mattering quite so much where the inputs come from. They can get there pretty fast from anywhere else. You can transfer them to an area that has a comparative advantage in the next thing that needs to be done, whether it's smelting or rolling the material or weaving the cloth, uh, cutting, stamping, assembling um, on, on to the consumer. Um, and this comes to an era where it starts to make economic sense, even if it doesn't necessarily make uh, obvious sense to, to regular old people to do th something like dig bauxite out of the ground in Australia and ship it to Iceland, which is about as far away as you can get from Australia, because they have cheap geothermal power, and turn that bauxite into aluminum, and then ship that to China where it gets rolled or pressed or um, put into shape to, uh, to become uh, whatever we need, and then shipping that ac back across the world uh, to the US and putting it on store shelves. Um, so the distance that any of your um, items that you might have um, purchased uh, routinely isn't just from wherever it says on the sticker, made in such and such a place, but could be two or three steps behind that, if not more. Okay. So China comes along, um, back to that graph of, of their rise in exports, um, with uh, a policy change and an economic change when they decide they are going to follow on this uh, path of opening up to um, an export-oriented development strategy. Uh, the Chinese uh, Communist Party decides it's okay for some people to get rich first, as their uh, Deng Xiaoping famously says, on the way to uh, opening up the economy. And we get first the special economic zones and then the spread throughout China of uh, manufacturing for the export market. Um, along the way, uh, the Chinese realize that they uh, are causing some environmental problems, and they need some environmental policies to uh, protect their natural resources, protect the health of the people, and so forth. Uh, just like a lot of other countries, and if you go back in the US in the 50s and 60s, especially up to Earth Day in 1970, we had an awakening that all of this economic progress that we had uh, achieved after World War II was coming at a, an environmental cost. So uh, this, is, this map is attempting to show where different countries are in terms of the performance of their environmental policies to protect uh, health and natural resources. 
And as you see here, the US and uh, joined with Canada are in the light green. We're pretty good. Um, I think in, uh, if you took this back a generation, we would have been on the cutting edge of this. And it's interesting that we've slipped behind some of the European countries here in terms of uh, both uh, putting effective environmental policies on the books and also enforcing them. Um, and then China's a step down here in the yellow, but there are other countries that are, that are worse. So China's gone from not having a lot of policies to at first adopting some of the US policies to tailor to Chinese conditions, but not enforcing them very well, uh, to now having enough popular demand uh, from uh, people who don't like living next to smokestacks or having their rivers turn uh, whatever color of dye happens to be popular that year. Um, and enforcing um, with increasing vigor uh, some of the environmental policies. So they're not at the, the bottom of the barrel uh, by any means. But they are a step uh, below the US and some of the other industrialized countries in terms of the, what's governed by their policies and what um, enforcement actually happens. Um, this starts to matter because uh, if you are uh, interested in producing some product that has an environmental negative side effect, a negative externality, you might consider the rules in place in different countries when you decide where to locate your factory. So if you want to produce something that sends a lot of smoke into the air or effluent into the river, and you look into this map, it's like, well, you're not going to go to Sweden, because they're just not going to let you do it. And if you go to the US, uh, you might be able to do it, but you've got to get a permit, and you might have to pay a lot to clean it up. Uh, and if you go to China, you might just be able to do it, or you might have to clean it up, but not quite to the same standard as you would in the US. Uh, or if you go to India or some of the countries in Africa, you might just be able to do this uh, without anyone looking at all. Uh, so there's a, a debate in uh, the environmental policy community over whether this thing exists called a, the race to the bottom or the race to the dirty bottom. Um, will companies see this range of policies and decide to locate their processes in a place where they can get away with bad stuff? Uh, and of course, most of the reputable companies say, no, no, no we don't work like that at all. Uh, if we're, if uh, Coca-Cola is going to build a bottling plant, they're just going to use the same blueprints, whether they build it in California or Sichuan or uh, in India. Um, and the, the uh, environmental uh, negative effects are going to be the same in any place. And since they have to work in California or they have to work in France, they're just going to build all of their plants to the same standard. And there's some evidence that US and European and Japanese companies when they do invest or um, team up with Chinese companies, they really do hold themselves to the same standards that they would here. Um, but there are certain industries that are just dirtier than others. Um, car batteries are, are particularly bad. Anything involving uh, smelting that has lead or other heavy metals. Uh, and they just get harder and harder to do in countries with higher environmental standards. So they tend to uh, move to these other countries. Um, about 10 years ago, I reviewed a paper that uh, was finding that when Chinese companies invested in other countries, so direct foreign investment from China out into the world, that they furthered that, that uh, they tended to move their dirtier industries out of China into other places. And that was a uh, cause for concern. But uh, just this last month, I had a paper from a colleague who said, well, interestingly enough, that's changed. And when China invests in, say, a coal-fired energy plant, and they're investing a bunch in India and Southeast Asia, those plants are cleaner than the ones uh, built by companies in those countries. So they're bringing a higher Chinese uh, environmental standard and just keeping that standard as they invest um, elsewhere. So it's not all, all bad news when China's involved. Um, and uh, for a country that faced a lot of uh, resource constraints um, and has gone through a kind of dirty environmental um, development process, uh, things are on, on the upswing. But nevertheless, there is a difference. Uh, in fact, uh, just uh, looking back um, to this morning, uh, towards the end of, of Clay's presentation, we had a, a graph of the uh, Asia Society's environmental, or sorry, economic dashboard. And there were two areas where China had made positive progress. And, and one of them was um, environmental protection, and then another was trade. Um, so those, those areas still are important, I think, domestically uh, important politically in China. Um, so not all bad news there. Even if um, every country had the same environmental standards, as we think about moving production from one country to another, there is a displacement of whatever environmental harm there was going to be to that country. So uh, even if the effluents are kept to a minimum or the pollution, or even if the impact on land use, the land we're going to clear, 
um, and convert from one use to another uh, is the same. Um, it's just happening somewhere else. So if we get half of our um, sort of daily use items, uh, pens and paper and um, uh, plastic dishware and so forth, from China instead of from here, the, um, we have sa spared ourselves the dealing with the environmental implications of that. And we've just said, OK, you deal with that. Um, so even if, if it's not a difference in policy, there is that displacement that we might want to keep an eye on as we trace the uh, movement of um, goods across the globe. So in, uh, in my class, and, and I commend this to you, um, we read uh, this book, Pietro Rivoli's uh, Travels of a T-Shirt in a Global Economy. Anybody seen this one before? Or you may have heard, uh, if you're familiar with the NPR podcast Planet Money, where they attempted to replicate um, this exact thing. And, and the book is exactly what she says it is. She's an economist from uh, Washington, D.C. And she goes on vacation and buys a T-shirt. That's her in the, um, in the uh, lower left corner there. And uh, reads the tag on it, says made in China, and wonders, well, where did this come from exactly? And I'm an economist. I should know how this works. And so she tells the story more or less from the t-shirt's point of view. Um, she first goes to uh, um, the company that printed the silk screen on and asks, where did you buy the, the blank shirt? And they said, oh, it's this uh, supplier in Shanghai. She goes to Shanghai and says, well, I'm trying to trace this back. Where did you get the, uh, the cotton from? And the guy says, Texas. And she says, oh, OK, is that near here? And he said, no, 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 Texas, which you know, is Chinese for Texas, right? So, oh, OK, so back across the Pacific. And uh, in the upper left-hand corner here goes uh, to the part of Texas that is a major cotton producer. And at this point in the class, I remind uh, my students in Oakland that California is also a major cotton producer, uh, even though climatologically we have no business producing a lot of cotton. We don't have a lot of water. We don't, uh, climate's bad, but we have a lot of innovation. And uh, in California, the rule is water flows uphill towards money. So um, we fund a lot of um, cotton production in the Central Valley. Uh, if you ever drive down I-5, you might actually see some of the tufts of cotton coming off the trucks and sticking to the grill of your car. Um, so it could have been California, but it was Texas where the raw cotton come from, comes from. She traces the, uh, the uh, links from the cotton farm to the mill where it's bailed up and shipped to China, where then uh, in Shanghai it's, it's first uh, spun into thread and then woven into fabric and then finally cut into the shape of a t-shirt and sewn together. Then it gets, it's not on the map, but it actually gets sent to Florida where they put on that lovely uh, uh, bird there. She buys it, maybe she wears it for a while. And then when she decides she's done with it, what happens next? And so she does what a lot of us do. I'm cleaning out my garage this summer and take a bag of old clothes to Goodwill or to a, a place that'll accept your old clothes. US uh, donates fantastic amounts of rather good quality clothing um, into this market. And some of it gets uh, recirculated here. Some of it gets, um, is picked up as high value. And uh, you know, the stories that American jeans sell for hundreds of dollars in Japan, and things like that, are, are true, but not really a big part of it. A uh, big uh, portion of it gets sent to uh, Africa where the secondhand clothing market um, has uh, arisen as sort of a uh, minor but consequential part of the, the economy. And that's what uh, happens to her t-shirt. And she actually goes and finds a secondhand t-shirt dealer um, and talks to him about what this, this means for his, uh, his livelihood and economy. Um, so she was interested in the people and the economics and the tariffs and, and so forth. And in passing, uh, more than in passing, she covers the, the environmental issues that come up. And that I, I direct my class to to spend a little bit more time with those. And then, as I said, to pick a product of their own that, um, that they want to follow um, in, a, in a similar fashion. So when we think about environmental impacts that you might be looking for, you can uh, split these up in different ways. But at each stage, uh, you might look for any of these, these four. So there's extraction of a natural resource. Uh, and what are the impacts associated from that? If it's a metal, if it's a mineral resource, is, it, or is there petroleum involved? How, does, how do we get it out of the ground? How much of the ground do we have to disturb um, to, uh, to get it out? Um, if, it's, uh, if it's farming, do we have to uh, clear land that was used for something else? Um, if it's mining, are we digging a big hole? Uh, one uh, rule of thumb that came up is that if we're talking about building a, a building, every building we see that's this big, 
probably produced a hole in the ground about that big somewhere else. Uh, because not only are there, uh, you know, we have a steel beam here that's holding up, holding up the roof, um, but there was a lot more rock and ore and other things that had to be um, dug up to get that much steel out. So think about every building you've been in and imagine somewhere in, on the earth there was a hole that big. Um, then we have to transport that stuff somewhere. How do we do that? By truck, by ship, uh, by rail, by people carrying it on their backs. Um, a lot of that, maybe almost all of that at this point, uh, is fossil, fossil fuel driven. And that's one of the um, biggest uh, contributors to carbon emissions. Um, airline traffic in particular is the fastest growing sector in terms of carbon emissions globally. Um, and we don't, uh, you know, we may see, uh, we see on the freeways around here a lot more electric cars than you used to, but uh, electric airplanes are a long way off. You imagine the battery that you need to, you know, fly a plane. So um, that's going to be carbon dependent for an awfully long time. And uh, some of the high value uh, items that we buy, including, uh, you know, our little phones and things, are now flying across the Pacific so they can get here in time for Apple's next product announcement. Uh, they don't even want to wait for the month or so that it's going to take to to get a container ship across the Pacific. Um, so there's there's an environmental impact there. Um, you can actually even trace it back to the impact of digging up the petroleum and refining it in the first place. Um, then there's manufacturing, the actual process. Uh, do we have to heat stuff up? Do we have to turn machinery? Uh, do we, um, in the process of refining something, what happens to the stuff we don't want, the effluent? Um, for students who were interested in pharmaceutical products or anything to do with uh, metal, there were a lot of different things that come out of the process there. So what happens to that into the air, into the soil, into the water? Um, and then, uh, I didn't put up here, but using it, is there any effect of using the device? So some of them you've got to fuel up or charge up or um, on a daily basis. Um, and then finally, you're going to get rid of it someday. You're going to be done with it. What happens then? Is it something that you can take all the pieces and recycle? Is there anything that can be composted? Is it going to go to and have a second life in another market, like the t-shirt the we followed to Africa? Um, is it going to end up in a landfill? And where is that landfill? And who manages that landfill for the uh, you know, generations it will take for that to um, biodegrade, if indeed it will biodegrade at all? So we're going to try to keep these in mind, these four uh, basic areas, as, as we move along. Um, to frame them a different way, uh, we're going to think a bit about land use. How does the land get changed? We're going to think about pollution, um, stuff that gets emitted into the air that uh, doesn't otherwise belong there, air, soil, water. Uh, we're going to think about energy consumption, and then we're going to think about social change or displacement of people from one place or one uh, kind of life to another, uh, and maybe health impacts along the way. So sort of framing uh, these, those four in, um, in these other different ways. So I have uh, two basic websites that um, I send my students to, and they often uh, use these as, as leaps to, to other resources to, to research. But um, are you familiar with Alibaba? Have you heard of that company? Yeah. Um, so anyone go to the 99 Ranch Markets ever? They have the best noodles and stuff? Okay. And now at the checkout counter, there's a little sign there that there are three words you need to know in Chinese. There's ni hao, there's xie xie, and there's alipay. Um, <laughs> so you can pay with the, the, your account on Alibaba. But of course, they started as this platform for um, uh, suppliers, small factories across China, to let the world know we've got this product and we can sell it to you. Uh, and uh, really, at the essence of globalization is this idea that you're going to have specializations in lots of different places, and they can connect efficiently uh, online and they say, okay, well, I need this many tons or this many widgets, and you can produce it by this date and get it to this location for this cost. Um, so uh, I've gone on there, and for an example, um, I pulled up the, the town of Zoping in Shandong province, which happens to be where I did my dissertation field work, but a lot of American researchers have gone through Zoping over the years. Uh, it was one of, it was, uh, I suppose it was really the first um, American research site outside of a, a major city that was opened up in um, the discussions between President Carter and Deng Xiaoping in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And so I, when I got there, they had a whole office set up to deal with American researchers coming through. 
Uh, and they said something about, you know, and if we came to you, you'd have an, America, uh, an office set up to welcome our researchers. And I said, I don't think we have that in San Mateo County, but um, maybe. Um, so Zoping, um, it's a little bit south of the Yellow River. Uh, it used to be a six hour drive from the capital, Genon, and now it's uh, less than an hour on the superhighway that's been built through. Uh, you can see across the map there going just south of the hill at the center of town. Um, so I went on Alibaba just to see what kind of companies um, they, they have, and they, there are a bunch of them. You could search Alibaba for Zoping or your favorite place, or you can search by, um, by product. And so for today, um, how many people actually have uh, Google Earth up at this point? Um, so I'm going to suggest we follow uh, one of the projects that my students um, picked, and it wasn't terribly surprising, uh, was an iPhone or a MacBook. Uh, that a lot of them had. And they thought, well, let's see where, where the parts of that come from. Um, some of the other products that they chose, one I liked was nice and simple. It was just oolong tea. Uh, where does it get cut and dried? That was and sort of a, a direct, what do you trade China for? We'll start with tea. We've been doing that for a long time. Uh, others picked a Sharpie pen and realized it's got a plastic body, it's got ink, it's got felt, which comes from wool, which comes from sheep, which also come from Shandong uh, province. Um, and, uh, and then one uh, student was, um, had started a side business. She was a K-pop fan and would uh, design little uh, enamel pins with her favorite K-pop uh, stars. And then she went searching and found that you can uh, find enamel pin manufacturers in China who will happily make you a small batch uh, of pins. Um, and so she found where they were actually located and where they get the enamel from and so forth. Um, but we'll start with this, and then uh, as time permits, we might do some, do some others. So, um, so for the iPhone or for the, the MacBook, the first place to start, we decided, would be the case. And the, the MacBook case is an aluminum um, shell, right? So you gotta dig, you gotta make some aluminum, you gotta dig some bauxite out of the, the ground. And there are just a few places in the world that produce that in, in large quantities. And at the time, the largest producer was, uh, may still be uh, Australia. And so uh, if we um, have you go to uh, Google Earth and, well, there's something I was gonna say about land use. I think I'll come back to that as we go. Um, have you go to, um, in Google Earth, uh, search for Mapoon, M-A-P-O-O-N, uh, in Queensland, Australia, and see what you can find there. And I'm gonna try, um, can ask the AV folks to um, shift me over to Google Earth Okay, and as I said, so I'm gonna be using Google Earth up here on the Chrome browser, which is what some of you may have. Uh, you can get a bit more functionality um, for your class if it's feasible to um, download the Google Earth program, Google Earth Pro, uh, on, which works on uh, PCs and Macs. Uh, and you can even do it on, on a phone here. I've got Mapoon uh, queued up on my, my Google Earth app here too. Um, so this happens to be one of the larger uh, mines in, in Australia is located in this area. And you might say, uh, I can't see that at all, but um, can I zoom in here? Hmm. I may need to be over here, so if that's okay. All right, thanks. All right, so general idea with Google Earth is you've got a digital uh, map of the globe comprised of satellite images and aerial photos that were all stitched together in a, in a more or less seamless fashion. And then they've labeled it with place names and even down to street addresses um, as many places they can get. And so my students did some research and found that there's this large um, uh, aluminum mine or bauxite mine in Mapoon and they got the, they didn't get a street address, but they said, well, it's, it's uh, five kilometers south of this river here. And if you zoom in, you can see this uh, suspiciously straight uh, road coming down from the Chardon, Chardon River. And uh, down at the bottom here, we have a big hole in the ground. And, and I think a little airstrip there to get the uh, executives in and out. Um, <laughs> and cut into basically a rainforest, right? We're in uh, northern Queensland um, uh, on the edge of the tropics there. And so you can see we've got a hole, we've got some, uh, an area that's been uh, you know, used for industrial uh, work, we've got some uh, um, 
tailing ponds or something like that for the, the wastewater that gets pumped out. Um, and then we've got some suspicious uh, other lines cut into the ground or into the rainforest around here um, that I'm guessing are from past mining that has been um, uh, reforested. And so Australia actually has pretty good rules for um, cleaning up industrial waste and mining activity. So you can mine for a while, but when you're done with that mine site, you've got to put it back uh, as, as best you can the way it, it was before. Um, so here's, here's where we start on that journey of, a, um, uh, of where the bauxite comes out of the ground. And then there are a number of places where that bauxite might be sent to be turned into aluminum. It might stay in Australia, uh, but just out of uh, uh, a bit of a China bias and because uh, I found that there's actually a factory that does this in uh, the county of Zilping where I did my research, I'm going to have us go there next. So if you're on Google Earth, you can go over to the search bar here and type in uh, Zilping and then Chong, uh, Shan. Okay, and let's see if it uh, takes us somewhere close there. And it's kind of neat effect because it's going to fly us there. Okay. All right, so there's Changshan Town. It's going to spin us around a little bit. And all of a sudden, instead of being in the rainforest, we're in a, a fairly rapidly developing urban landscape with uh, just on the edge of it um, the agriculture, the intense agriculture that you expect in North China. Actually, I forgot to do this on the first one, but while we're here, um, go ahead and make a bookmark out of this one uh, by clicking that uh, little bookmark tag over there. And this is going to save this on your computer. It might ask you if you're willing to let it do that. Um, and we'll just bookmark each of these as we go. Um, for their final presentation, what I have my students do is uh, fly us through the path that they've charted and talk at each stage about what uh, the environmental and social impacts would be. So we've, uh, we've got a... Um, a bookmark, I'm going to save that, and um, I'll allow it, yep, okay. So we're in the right town, in the right county, but um, my students were able to do a bit more research on where the um, actual factory was that um, processes bauxite and turns out aluminum ingots, and when we looked in the neighborhood, we we've, we've pretty soon figured out why that factory is there. So if you uh, can scroll a little bit to the north, can I scroll, there we go. Uh, so the address for the factory is in uh, Qianhuai Sun or Qian, um, Qianhuai Village. And uh, if you see those four cooling towers lined up right here, there's a huge uh, coal-fired electric um, generating facility right there. And so they're as close as they can be to cheap electric power, and that's the thing you need to make, uh, make aluminum. So and I think the factory is just over across the street. Um, so we're going to imagine that the, um, the bauxite gets shipped here, gets put on rail cars, probably at the port of Qingdao. We could map, add that to our map um, and get sent here, turned into aluminum ingots, sort of a standard commodity. And, and this is a chance for me to pause and say, um, yeah, I know that's not exactly the very piece of aluminum that goes into your MacBook. And uh, this is what we're going to find out, which is the same thing that uh, Pietro Rivoli found out about the um, cotton in her t-shirt, is that in today's gl global commodity market, you can't trace one thing all the way through. Um, things get combined, things get, uh, whoever was the highest or lowest bidder on a given day gets tossed into the pool and people pull out of that pool. So when Planet Money, uh, the podcast tried, they actually went to Texas and tried to buy a bale of cotton and then sell it on into the, uh, the to get it produced into a t-shirt. And they're like, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. You, you buy a bale of cotton, you get money for it. And then over here, you pull out a bale of cotton, and it's not the same one when you want to make a t-shirt. So we're, um, and the students generally get this, we're trying to illustrate the, the representative path um, um, as best we can, even though we know that there are a lot of other paths that it could be. Question? Okay, so um, Alibaba uh, was the site, and they dug down deep enough to get a street address or a village address, something like that, yeah. Sometimes um, you can get it just from that one jump, and then the students are clever if it, if it says just the name of the county but not the address, they can do some other Google searching and, um, and be sort of brave about uh, when they get uh, uh, websites that turn up in Chinese, then say, okay, Google Translate will work with that. We're just trying to get an address, a postal code, some clue, 
And then when you look on the map, look around. And, and sometimes it's the only thing for miles around in the, in the field. It's like, okay, that's the factory. Um, this is what brings me back. Um, I'll, sh I'll shift back now that we've seen some of the landscape um, to how to interpret these aerial maps. Because um, some people do this sort of intuitively, or they've been working with um, Google Earth or Google Maps for all their life. But um, I want to think about, OK, well, what do things look like from the sky? And there are three interesting land use patterns in China that you'll see as you go through this exercise. Um, starting from the bottom, the um, older settlements uh, from the 80s or prior uh, sort of natural settlements tend to be um, smaller buildings, smaller grain to them, and less of a geometric feel. I mean, you can sort of see that there's an alley going through here and courtyard houses and so forth. Um, fewer of the blue roofs, which are either metal or solar panels, um, and less shadows because they're not as tall. And then you get from the periods of the 50s through the 80s this uh, work unit housing so associated with factories or offices. Um, and they tend to be um, sort of apartment blocks all lined up, but not, not quite as um, with the eye to aesthetics. Um, they're sometimes called Stalinist architecture, right? Um, and then at the top, the, um, the newest kinds of developments and those sort of most high, uh, high value are these, um, uh, they call them super blocks of, of development that are designed much more with an eye to aesthetics, sometimes with uh, characteristic uh, Western or Chinese architectural styles. Uh, and you'll see these patterns like circles and swoops and birds seen from the air and so forth. Um, often, again, also the high rise um, as well. Um, and in these blocks, uh, sometimes as big as a kilometer square. Um, so as you're zooming over the landscape in Zoping or wherever it is, and you see these different clusters, the middle of the town might look more like this if it hasn't been torn down and redeveloped. You'll see this around some of the older factories in, in the towns that had industry earlier on. And then the um, the new um, uh, gated communities that have sprung up uh, more recently since that. Uh, another pattern you'll see is the the interface of agricultural land and um, these newer developments. And so it's a fair assumption um, anywhere in eastern China that um, if there's agricultural land next to what you're seeing, that uh, say this power plant, that before the power plant was there. Uh, it was agricultural land as well. Pretty much every flat piece of land and some of the not so flat pieces of land were um, uh, intensively cultivated uh, not that long ago. So here we go, a little village that's uh, not so uh, developed um, just across some fields from this power plant. Okay, in the time that's remaining, our next stop, back to uh, this one, um, iPhone City. So we talked about Foxconn this morning being the major uh, producer for Apple and a lot of the other tech companies. It's a Taiwanese uh, firm that set up shop uh, in Taiwan and then in Shenzhen and now is spread. So if you'll search in, in uh, Google Earth for Foxconn Zhengzhou Science Park, we'll go there next. All right, we're going to fly out of Shandong province into, uh, what is that, Hunan, Zhengzhou, and we've got a little tour there. And we pr probably need to zoom out to get uh, appreciate just what, how big we're looking at. I'm going to uh, bookmark this so it'll be on our tour. And say done. And I want to zoom out here. All right, this is. A heck of a big factory. It just keeps going. And it's not even really in Jungo. It's on the outskirts of the city, which we're going to see out here a ways. Um, so there's Jungo proper up to the northwest. Uh, um, but the other thing we'll see right just to the south of the Jungo Science Park is the new international airport. And about half of the iPhones made in the world are made in this one facility, um, as of last time anyone would it Apple's kind of closed-lipped about this sort of thing, but um, as far as we know. And uh, there's a good chance that if you have one, uh, it got on a plane here, an A380 or something like that, and flown across the Pacific to LA and then into the distribution network um, so that it could be ready for the next uh, announcement of a new product, something like that. So um, 
Obviously, Apple's very concerned about uh, people not getting an advanced look on their, at their products, but also getting them out. So there's a lot of security around who can see which parts and who gets to put them together at the end and then how quickly they can get on that plane and over here. So my students would be mapping first the development of this um, facility on what was uh, mostly agricultural land, but probably given the pattern and the distribution of uh, villages, there were probably a fair number of villages that were cleared out of the way to make room for this. Uh, both the, the science park and the, uh, the airport facility. And then we might think, okay, what's the, the land use change there? Again, what's the um, social displacement or the health issues going along with that? What's the increased energy consumption and so forth? Um, all right, so we're gonna assume that the next stop on this, it's flown across the Pacific. We could map the airports. We could map the transportation network in California. Um, but I think the nearest Apple store to here is up the road at the Hillsdale Shopping Center. So we're gonna search for that next. All right, so here we're gonna fly. And for other products, we might be, say, going to the nearest port and thinking about the Port of Long Beach or the Port of Oakland. Um, and then uh, trucks or however it's gonna be. I think the Apple Store is actually over in that part of the mall, but close enough for our purposes. A uh, little bit different land use pattern that you see around here. Um, you can think about the difference is uh, both culturally and policy-wise about expectations about zoning and what kind of things we build where who gets to be next to who else, uh, the size of the houses that people live in, um, and so forth. Um, and uh, I actually have them mapped to where they are now, so they might be mapping to their dorm room or our classroom, but I'll have us mapped to uh, where we are today, 101 uh, Twin Dolphin Drive in Redwood City. And uh, at that point, some of the students will put in their own picture or picture of the classroom or something like that. Um, if we were going to, um, when you're done with your phone or your device and uh, it's, it's lived its useful life uh, in San Mateo, you might just uh, put it in a recycling bin. And where would that go? And so, so I'm gonna bookmark this and then go to the uh, Shoreway uh, Recology Center. Uh, I think I can get it here. Recology San Mateo, which happens to be just down the street here. And at this point, um, until a year or two ago, uh, the students probably would have traced the aluminum or the plastic or the paper uh, that they're recycling back to China because huge amounts of, of American goods um, uh, travel back to China and were put back into uh, a productive system, some of them. Um, turns out a lot of them were just piling up there or, or getting dumped into the river and so forth because um, it wasn't um, economically viable. And then, uh, as you probably heard, China said, no, we're gonna stop doing this. And they greatly raised the standards for what kind of waste materials they would accept from the US and other trading partners. Um, so at this point, this year, we don't go back to China across the Pacific. Um, and the chances are that it's gonna go to a place like this. So let's look for the Ox Mountain landfill. And that's uh, over the hill on the way to Half Moon Bay. So we've got some green space there. And down this canyon uh, is where San Mateo disposes of, of most of its trash. And increasingly, uh, uh, most, some of its uh, recyclable materials because we can't get rid of it um, any other way. So I'm gonna zoom out here again just to see what we're looking at. We're just a few miles from the ocean in a uh, fairly verdant part of the county, but uh, tucked away there um, is where the, where the trash goes. Um, and I want students to make that full connection that, uh, you know, of the lifespan of what they, they buy. They're gonna buy another iPhone or another MacBook, but the one that they are done with is still somewhere, you know, conservation of matter and energy, right? So it's, uh, it still exists and it's gonna exist into the indefinite future. Um, okay, so um, what I'm hoping we'll um, take away from this, what my students will take away from this and what, what you might is the sense of the scale of the global supply chain and the sense of that everything comes from somewhere and has an impact at each point along the way. Um, the, um, uh, the Google Earth tour helps illustrate that and, um, and sort of prods the students to think about those places and think that they're real people down there and they're trees and they're 
um, our sheep making the wool for the Sharpie pens and so forth. Um, and tally up all of those, um, uh, those different impacts. I have to just change one more slide and then perhaps we can have a discussion or some questions about how you'd implement that. All right, so there's, uh, there's our tour for this one product. Um, so just to have in mind, through each of those steps, for each of those places, what the, the impacts were. Um, and I'd be really happy with my college students if they uh, turned this into a table, if they added um, illustrations, maybe some pictures on the ground, street view, or um, so forth. Um, on the disposal side, the uh, organization called the um, Basel Action Network, which is concerned about international waste trade, uh, did some very uh, interesting uh, investigation of what uh, the recycling facilities in China were like. And more recently, um, this book by uh, Anna Laura Wainwright uh, about what it's like to live in some of the villages that were the hub of the electronic recycling industry, um, bearing some of the uh, environmental burden of, say, burning off the plastic to get at the copper and so forth. Uh, why the Chinese government is not so um, thrilled about having that being a major industry, but why the people there, depending on the the income from it are not so happy about the, uh, the ban uh, either. Um, so thinking through this and uh, maybe become a little more aware in uh, their own choices, uh, conscious uh, when they throw something away that it isn't really going away. Um, that wouldn't be a bad place to end. Um, and also feeling connected to uh, when it says made in China, that's a real place, a real thing, and they might go there. All right, so um, I, am I just on time to take some questions or discuss more or maybe get uh, suggestions from any of you how this might actually play out in, in your classes at whichever level your, uh, your students are. Very, very quickly, one of the things you were talking about was this environmental impact and the question of outsourcing pollution. And I don't know if your students have tried to do that because the skies in America may be a little bit cleaner than they once were, partly because so much of the, manuf the dirty manufacturing is offshore. And one of the things that we hear a lot about is that, so that, that dislocation and the extent to which you and your students have been able to explore that. But also the question now, we have Japan cutting off supplies of chemicals to South Korea to make semiconductors because they're unhappy with certain things and now South Koreans are boycotting Japanese products and all of that kind of thing. And we've heard about rare earths and those issues. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about that, about uh, how fragile mm. this incredible just-in-time manufacturing has become. Yeah, at, 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 on the one hand, it's brilliant, uh, but on the other hand, it uh, just-in-time multiplies the number of, of vulnerabilities, uh, where if something breaks, the whole system grinds to a halt. The rare earths come up in terms of uh, cell phones, and I'm going to forget what the rare earth is that you need in every cell phone, but there, there are at least a couple. Um, China produces some of it domestically, but not as much as they import um, from, I want to say, West Africa um, in some areas that have been subject to conflicts. Um, in the U.S., we get skittish about doing trade with those countries and say, oh, we won't do it. Um, but we still are quite happy to import the iPhones that have it in them at, at a later stage in the process. Um, China has been, uh, as a national policy, like. Trade is good, and uh, you, your internal problems are your internal problems, and can be just meet at the border and pick up the rare earths. Um, so yeah, that definitely came up. Um, uh, one of my student groups tried to find the mines in Africa and talked a bit about um, regional conflicts there, and I'm not going to do that justice. Um, actually had a, a wonderful class with the Africa Studies uh, professor at Mills, where we combined our two classes for the day and had that conversation. Um, point out that uh, you know it, it's less of a stretch than you might think to compare the country of China and the continent of Africa. There are a lot more countries in Africa, but there's actually more people in China uh, in terms of size and natural resources and things. Uh, there are some natural complementaries, complementarity areas there uh, that, that uh, China is quite happy to build those ties and, um, and help develop so that uh, the supplies keep flowing 
the, the iPhone and all the other production lines don't break down for lack of a, a critical ingredient. Um, we might be a little skittish about that. No, that, uh, that a, great, a great description of how complicated uh, and how engaged all of us, all of us, are in, in this mix. One of my, you know, so you know about the iPhones and all that sort of thing. One of the things that fascinates me is they're actually manufacturing hotels in China and sending them to the United States. Uh, Citizen M branded hotels. They send the rooms, all built with the plumbing and all that stuff, comes in and they assemble them, stack them up. So all kinds of things get made. We have a bunch of questions, so let's get to some of them. Uh, this gentleman had one. There you go, Mike. Yeah. That you're doing with your students. Mm -hmm. uh, do you uh, have, have you had students trace uh, the value added to the product? And you mentioned just briefly the social concerns at some of these levels. Um, elaborate on what you see. So um, I, I think those are both really good ideas, and that uh, an economics class really would want to trace that. Uh, the closest we get um, is looking at the tariffs uh, on, in terms of the value added. What um, what tariffs get imposed as the components get brought into different countries and um, gets them to explore the, um, the massively complicated US tariff code, uh, differences between uh, rainproof and not rainproof jackets. And um, one of the reasons that many of my students are wearing um, flip flops that don't have a strap around the back is that that strap turns it into a sandal which has a tariff at a completely different level. Um, one of my students did, um, Pillow pets. Do you all know pillow pets? Uh, they're uh, they're like stuffed animals, but you unfold them and they're a pillow, and it's kind of cute. And and their slogan used to be, "Is it a pillow or is it a pet?" And it turns out that that distinction is in the tariff code. If it's um, if it's a stuffed animal, there's no tariff, but if there's a pillow, there's a tariff. And so some clever um, pillow manufacturing company in Taiwan said, "Well, if we put some eyes and you know stripes on it, we can sell it to the U.S. without a tariff." Um, so it creates a new industry. And then, of course, the Chinese market just knocks that off immediately, and then we get a proliferation of pillow pets. All of my students were familiar with pillow pets. Um, so the tariff part of the value add is certainly in there, and, and I do have them go you know, check off, you know, how's, how's this product going to be classified by the time it hits the port of Long Beach or the port of um, um, Oakland? Now, the, um, the social impact, yeah, that is a big part of our class and also a big part of Rivoli's book. Um, who works in these factories? Why do they work there? And we're going to hear a bit about um, migrant worker protections and, and that issue in China. It's, it's an important one. Um, but Rivoli makes the point that um, you know, it, it is, to the extent um, probably uh, we don't appreciate it, a fairly free labor market in China for people to decide that they want to go work in a factory instead of staying on the farm. And they uh, make a choice that it's economically or socially or for their family better to up and migrate to factories uh, to seek that kind of work rather than, say, staying in agricultural labor. Um, uh, one example was uh, a Japanese uh, research team of sociologists had um, been going to the Yangtze River Delta and interviewing um, farmers for years. And they came back in the early 2000s and they couldn't find any more farmers because people had made the choice to switch. Um, so yes, there and there are important um, issues about the social control of that and the exposure to pollution and so forth. Um, but it's also an economic opportunity that people are taking. Um, and then as we saw the rise in, uh, in income uh, over the past decade or two, uh, it is truly uh, remarkable. Um, and uh, that's a, a side of China's economic growth that has been shared. Um, though interestingly, that um, both China and the US have a uh, problem with growing income inequality, which we would also get into that. Who, the factory workers and the factory owners are accelerating their incomes at rather different rates. Yeah, it is stunning that our inequality is very similar. Our Gini coefficient, you know, nudging up and up and up well over point uh, four, right? Mm -hmm. Scary. And so uh, other questions? On, on the Gini coefficient, uh, since you mentioned that, that's a measure of how unequal uh, income is in a country. Um, both countries going up. But if we were to merge and create the United States of China and America, that would lower it, right? Because uh, our uh, high and low income and their high and low income sort of uh, shift, um, cancel out. So anyway. The, law, the law, law of averages. We had a, a hand 
that went up and now it's disappeared? Oh, please. Yeah. I just wanted to make the comment. I have two younger kids. How, how much younger? Um, my kids are in eighth grade. Eighth grade, okay. So uh, what I really like about this exercise is that um, the critical thinking aspect mm -hmm. of it, and I can see that um, you know I would have a lot of kids with deer in the headlights looks at the critical thinking, and then um, that I could really use this and adapt it to any subject that I was teaching, mm -hmm. um, as far as a hands-on exercise for critical thinking and to ask questions at each stage, and that once you have your answer. Um, you're not done, that you can keep going. Um, I, I love the framing of that. And I, th I think, I, uh, if, if anything, I uh, pass on from this exercise today is you really could adapt this to lots of different levels. At some, it's about the research. Uh, but, uh, maybe it's about the mapping and the cartography. Um, but at any level, it's about thinking, right? It's like, OK, how do we, we get this information? And how do we think about that? And how do we take what we know and, and be critical about it? So, We've got another, yeah. another question here. Um, a couple of the science teachers at my school wanted to try to do some kind of environmental project with the school in China, and mm. they asked me to coordinate it, but I didn't get very far in terms of you know, figuring out how to do that. I was just wondering if you know of any websites or... And what, what grade are you covering? Uh, high school. High school. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a tricky thing, and I think the 1990 Institute is probably as good a place as any to start on, on that. Um, but these sort of collaborations that touch on something that might be sensitive um, get very hard on the Chinese side for them to follow through with. And even when I, um, I go as a guest um, in China, you know, what it's okay for me to talk about and what they'd really rather I didn't talk about um, come up. So um, yeah, the, the very recent history is okay. You go back a decade or two and we start all of a sudden like, oh wait, we're not supposed to talk about that in that way anymore. Uh, it, even just in terms of environmental policy, which is a national priority. Uh, my dissertation research was, uh, part of it was on the policy to um, preserve farmland. It was a national policy, everybody agreed on it. But then I started asking like, so that farmland there, was it preserved? It's like, oh, well, you know, yeah. So yeah, I think this would be, um, it would be hard to have Americans draw attention to a Chinese environmental problem. It might work the other way around though. So, um, even though I spent my graduate years studying China, when I go there, actually, I get a lot more questions about the US. How do they do that in California? When did California adopt this law? And so I have to study up a little bit on our side. So maybe the, the issue is that, like, uh, what's something that we have in common? Can we measure our air quality here? And uh, we have to cop up to the terrible air quality with the wildfires or something like that. Maybe that's a, a starting point that makes it more equal. Yeah, no, that's a, a terrific point, and in fact, one of the safe things is to, uh, I show slides of Los Angeles in the 40s and in the 60s and even in the 80s, um, and we still have, of course, bad days, and it's really stunning. So much so that in the 1940s, researchers at USC were pioneering not just masks, but space suits, you know, to, to, to cope with it. And the problem for the Chinese side is that civic action was involved in mm -hmm. making these demands and continues to be involved. And of course, we have a federal system and tensions between California and the United States over those kinds of emissions. But it is interesting. What can you do? Uh, maybe it's, it's possible with a partner school where you're already doing something else and they trust you. But if you go in and you say, I'd really like to know about your cancer village, uh, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. That's going to be a problem. But we've had a lot of students, including science students in science classes, because so much environmental data is now available from China via the web, especially through the Institute for Public and Environmental Affairs, uh, you can get information about water pollution. You can get information about air quality, things like that. And they can map it uh, and do that. So we've had people who have focused on Wuhan for example, and track that. It's not interactive. They're not interacting with students from those places, but it might be possible. But actually, there's nothing more. The two sensitive topics, three sensitive. Yeah, well, there might be a lot. It's a long. <laughs> it's a long list. But three, three quick ones, right? Number one, environment. 
gigantic because of the protests over chemical plants and things like that, but also land. Mark just talked about what happened to the farmland and local governments finance everything by selling farmland to developers to turn it into something else, okay? And there are those protests, those kinds of NIMBY protests as well. So you have those, and I promised you a third and I lost it, uh, except that could you do this with your students in China? Mm. No. Why? Oh, no, you, you can take your students, you can talk about every one of these things. Here's the challenge, no Google Earth. Yeah, no Google. Okay, uh, yeah, no Google generally. I, you know, with a VPN, it's still too glacially slow to do stuff with Google Earth, but that's why um, your kids will know Pokemon Go, ancient history. Oh, I did that when I was in elementary school. Uh, uh, Pokemon Go, that augmented reality. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, augmented reality. Uh, because it depended on Google Maps, it didn't work in China until what? Somebody figured out how to make it work with maps from Los Angeles. So you had students in Shanghai tooling around looking for the Pokemon stuff. I'm getting a desperate signal that we're out of time. Is that right? Yeah, OK. Um, I am happy to stay around. Um, I am happy to talk by email, mhenderson at mills.edu, um, either on the China side or any of your bright students who might be considering a liberal arts education in Northern California, a rare and special thing. Um, and uh, I'd love to hear your ideas um, going forward as uh, if you take any of these into your classroom. Let me know how it goes. Uh, my deal would be that in a few years, I get one of your students who's done this project who then shows up in my class and tells us how to do it better. So, uh, Doing it in a different way. Friends, we need to thank Mark. But before you do that, uh, I'd like to push something else he didn't talk about. But the question of regions of China, China is a diverse place. It's you know, fascinating. It's huge. It's diverse. And Mark has put together for Oxford Bibliographies this collection of resources about China's regions. Take advantage of that. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank Mark for a wonderful presentation. <laughs>